I'm, I'm sharing this morning, I'm going to continue sharing probably on the most important word, almost the most important thing that God has done in the whole of human history. And I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it, and I can never quote him verbatim, but there's a lot of things going on in our world, aren't there, at the moment? A lot of disquiet with uh, things, the Middle East, all across the Arabian Peninsula, the geopolitical things, problems with the world economy, Ebola. And uh, just to put that into perspective, I think the C.S. Lewis would say it's a grain of sand compared to what's going on into eternity. And that isn't to negate or to diminish the problems that our world and human beings are facing. Quite the opposite, it's to say God has done something about that. He's done something incredible about that. And I think into eternity, when we look far from anything being a grain of sand, we will see the cross of Jesus Christ lifted high and as, as, as high as the universe, if you like, just being able to gaze upon that naked man, that naked God-man who died for our sin. So I'm sharing this morning on the gospel, and the gospel with uh, Ellie talked about last week or the week before on identity, and uh, uh, Nicola was, was sharing on how that shapes us as human beings, as churches, in the way that we live our life. And uh, I shared really on the bigger picture, the big story of the gospel, of what God's done in human history, which is truly incredible. And today I want to kind of bring those three aspects um, of God, if you like, the gospel together. And I want to, I want to start really over everything that I share this morning from, from Jesus, who was constantly baffling the disciples who walked with him and baffling the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everyone else who, for one reason or another, thought that they had this thing worked out and they were beginning either to understand Jesus or they understood the Old Testament laws or what they were there for. And on this occasion, there's a rich young man, and I'm not going to go through it all, <coughs> but um, as, as Jesus spoke to this rich young man, it's in Luke chapter 18, Jesus looked at him and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Like many words of Jesus, many, many words of Jesus when we read them, they reveal to us, they confront us with the sheer impossibility of attaining to a relationship without God, without him. The sheer impossibility of it. And the disciples who... Um, I love, always ask Jesus the obvious question, the question that many times we don't want to ask him. We don't like to ask. I don't know if you've ever been in a, an institution or a, a cultural you know, work and you, you've got one of those bosses who really doesn't like to uh, be, he doesn't like it when you ask difficult questions. Have any of you had those? You might have been in churches, God forbid. You're not allowed to ask those difficult questions. But Jesus was never like that. He wanted the difficult questions asked. And of course, he didn't just take that verbatim. They, they answer, answered this way. Who can be saved then, Jesus? I mean, it's impossible. It's impossible. So who can be saved? And uh, Jesus said, and, and these are the words I want us to remember as we go through today, just talking about the gospel. What is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. You'll never glimpse the gospel, we'll never grasp an understanding of the gospel until we understand those words of Jesus. The sheer impossibility of human beings attaining to their own salvation by being good, by doing good works, by by pleasing people. The sheer impossibility of it. And Jesus declares it here really very straightforwardly and Peter then says but we've left everything and Jesus said no one who's left home or wife or brothers or sisters parents children for my sake and the kingdom will fail to receive as many times in this age and in the age to come eternal life and uh, like many aspects of the gospel and what I want to try and share today is is that it's much broader richer and deeper than we might think I have a Christian friend who's a brand new Christian and uh, she's been healed 
and uh, they've put her on a course at church, and they've told her that, um, you know, that the, the truth of the Bible and reason and uh, liturgy are all very important in her church. But she's an excitable brand new Christian. And she says, reason doesn't matter to me, and nor does liturgy. She said, the only thing that matters to me is that I found, and I know, and he's found me, Jesus Christ. And there's the words of every uh, kind of new Christian who discovers something and, and, and discovers just how wonderful um, God is. But you and I know as you go into the Christian life, you go deeper into the Christian life, we have to, we, we can just dis- discover more and more of what God um, is like, and at the same time, the simplicity of, and maintaining the simplicity of what she's just found. I was raised, really, um, I was raised as a, as a Catholic boy, I went to church, um, I'm grateful for all that, but I had to construct my own kind of salvation, so that's what I did. And I went to, you know, a church, four or five hundred people, and I, I almost learned to read. I remember my father would go through the liturgy with his finger, and that was one of the ways that I learned to read when I was four, five, six years old. It's not like today, um, where children, we can barely keep them in with the adults. I mean, we'd, I'd have to sit through an hour. And of course, like any young boy, I'd, I'd be waiting, and I'd go through the liturgy, one page to go, and then, then I can get out of here. But at the same time, there, were, there, were, there, was a, there was something good, something that I learned. But there was also something I didn't learn. And I remember as I would count up the people, my understanding of God was kind of moralistic. And so I was taught many things, and, and I genuinely thought, like many Pharisees, that I was quite good. And then I'd begin to compare myself to the other 400 people who would come to church every Sunday... And I thought, well, I'm not maybe in the top one or two, but I must be in the top ten somewhere. You know, I'm, that's how good I am. So my uh, moralistic understanding of what was um, really should have been just grace was to think that God views me or looks at me on the basis of my works and how good I am. That moral construct is very common in other religions And let me tell you, it's very easy and very common in Christianity as well, which is why we have to come back again and again and again to an understanding of what the the gospel is that Jesus preached and understand that what is impossible with men is possible with God. So that's a kind of a, a very light introduction to what I want to talk about. But then I want to, I want to look at those three aspects. And in certain ways, when those of you that have been Christians for a while, when you read the Apostle Paul, there are many, there's a lot of clarity there on the gospel. And we'll look at some of the things that Paul says. But then you read the words of Jesus. And somehow, those of you that, again, know the words of Jesus, Jesus talks a lot about works. And that's been extremely difficult for parts of the church, really. How do you fit in Jesus' teaching on works Jesus maybe mentions justification just a a handful of times. Nothing like the gospel that comes with Paul, who then understands what Jesus has done. I know in many parts of the church, as you take the words of Jesus, it's, it's no longer important for people to be converted, for people to find Christ, for people to meet Christ. That's a perversion of the gospel. I listened to the Pope a while ago because the, the Catholic agencies in the world do a tremendous amount of good. I mean, just a tremendous amount in serving and helping the poor. But the Pope stood up and said, we are not an NGO. We're not a, a non-governmental agency. In other words, we're not social workers. We're here to bring Jesus Christ to people. So that's a danger if we sometimes just take the words of Jesus but don't understand what Jesus is really saying, what he really wants from our lives. But then we can take some of the words of Paul and we can say, well, I'm saved by grace. We'll look at some of those words in a minute. And then what happens, I think, is what's happened in, in parts of our country and parts of the church. It's, it's like, well, works don't become that important because, of course, works, I can't be saved by works. I can only be saved by God. And so what role do works have? And they have a big part in our Christian life and the construct of our Christian life and how we're meant to and what we're meant to look like. And then lastly, just to um, touch a little bit on 
um, history, if you like, doctrine, what the Bible says is so important. Because again, if we're to understand the gospel, we're to understand it, it, it alters our identity and who we are. It alters the way we live. It alters the way we treat people. It alters everything, not just a little bit. And it also alters, <coughs> in terms of our lives and our value, it alters our eternal future and where we're going. So let me just read to you from Mark chapter 1, where really Jesus brings out these different aspects. But uh, again, I, so I'm raised a Catholic boy, and uh, there I am thinking that I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a bad person really, and I, I try to be a good person. And then I had a major experience of Jesus, just a tremendous experience of God. And let me tell you, I'd had experiences of God growing up as a Catholic boy, and, and, and in Catholic liturgical church services, God had spoken to me, and, and uh, I remember even before taking communion, crying. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Some of you will know that uh, from Catholic liturgy, and I, I was crying. So it wasn't like God didn't touch me or that, or that I wasn't being drawn to the presence of God. And then I came in and like my, my friend who's become a Christian, it was like I'm saved by grace. I don't have to do any work. He saved me. And that became, if you will, the gospel. And then I went to, um, you know, I, I went to one of the, the starting vineyard churches and I, I thought, well, they'll have it all worked out. They'll have this thing worked out. I pretty soon discovered that like, Much of the church, we discover the gospel and we rediscover the gospel and we rediscover it and discover Jesus evermore. Well, when I went to that church, the gospel was something that was preached maybe once or twice a year. It was an invitation and it demanded a response from people. If they wanted to receive Jesus, that was the gospel. And if we were to talk about the gospel or to preach the gospel, that had to involve and and be quite involved and and it had to mention the cross and it we'd have to talk about many things about Jesus. And then there was the invitation to receive Christ. But my feeling about that gospel was it was too narrow and too shallow and too short and it was only mentioned once or twice a year. What about all the non-Christians who come into church for various reasons? Every other week, can they not hear the gospel? Can they not find Jesus? And I think both ways, we we kind of reduce the gospel in some way and reduce Christ or domesticate him and make it fundamentally difficult for people to get in when Christ is open-armed and it's so easy to come in. His grace, he makes it easy, not difficult, for anyone to find him, for anyone to come in. Jesus makes that tremendously easy without having, having, if you will, to lower the bar on our sin or anything else. In Mark chapter 1, the beginning, this is what Mark says. He says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. Mark is leaving no doubt whatsoever, and nor is John the Baptist, that Yahweh himself is turning up in Israel, and he is about to reveal to Israel what God is truly and ultimately like. That's the beginning, that's the culmination of 1,500 years of salvation history, of forming a civilization, of, of uh, bringing prophets and teachers and laws and everything else and giving them a temple and showing them and revealing to them something of the presence of God and yet still Israel wasn't to understand until it was fully revealed to them through Jesus Christ. That's part of the gospel. So when Mark is saying this, it's, it's kind of this part of the gospel is the heralded part, it's the good news part, it's the part we share and shout and preach and um, with everyone. This is the good news. God himself has come. God's come into this world. It's wonderful, joyous, amazing news, the news we celebrate um, at Christmas. And this quote from Isaiah, um, again, just just really fulfilling Daniel's prophecy. And so they're ready and they come out by their hundreds and then by their thousands. People that 
the world might demean or look down upon. And I always feel sorry for the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they're so easy the way that we can become when we try and be holy and we try and be good and we try not to sin. All the right things. And very subtly and very gradually we begin to believe that in some way our works are pleasing to God or are saving us. Worse still, they're saving us or even keeping us in the kingdom, which are complete lies and complete falsehoods. Whatever role our works have, they have no role in either keeping us in or saving us. Only Jesus can do that. And uh, I do feel for the Sadducees and the Pharisees because in their endeavor to obey the law, all they did really was to condemn themselves. And that's all the law does for you and me. And that's a contrast, really. That's a contrast between one and the other. Let me read to you what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 8 about this. He says, those of you who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The role of the Spirit is is just incomparable in the New Testament, something no one could fully understand. Someone said to me, the Spirit's everything. He really is in this life. The Holy Spirit is so essential to living the Christian life. Because without him, we can't be guided. We, We can't know God. We'll fall into one trap or the other. We'll become legalists. And if we're not legalists, then we fall into the other trap and we, we just don't walk the way that Jesus would have us walk. He says, the spirit you receive does not make, make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Paul's hinting at what it was like before. You see, if you and I think that our good works might save us, that by being a better person might save us, we begin to try and obey the laws of God, the laws that are reflective of God's holiness, that are reflective of his perfection. And we begin to think, as we begin to try and obey those laws, that somehow those laws bring us closer to God. And do you know what those laws do? Do you know what Paul says those laws do as we try? They enslave us and they condemn us because we never match up. We never come close. Sometimes the law can be a good thing because as we begin to understand just how perfect and how holy God is, what does that do? It turns us, it it causes us to kneel down and say, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God help me. I can't attain to it by myself as you begin to. I remember many years ago listening to Derek Prince's testimony and he was a professor of Greek at, um, I think it was Cambridge. He'd read Plato, he'd read Socrates, he'd read the Aristotle and uh, he decided as an academic exercise because he was fluent in ancient Greek that he would read the Bible and uh, read it in its original Hebrew and Greek. And he said it was the only book as he began to read it, he said it began to read him. And whereas before he'd felt quite confident, quite self-assured, quite cozy in his own righteousness, as he began to read what God was like, he began to feel deeply uneasy with himself and his sin. He began to feel that just as he read it. He began to read him. And of course, ultimately then, it points towards Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel. And that simplicity, to, or that's part of the gospel, that simplicity of the gospel is something really that we, we just have to come back to again and again and again and again. I just sometimes imagine myself underneath the cross, just that blood covering me again and again and again. I need his blood. I need his forgiveness. I need to know again and again and again that it isn't me, it isn't my works that save me, it's him. So when Mark is, is, is heralding this and quoting this, of course, the second thing is he's, he's talking from history. He's saying that this event happened in human history. I was talking to uh, my accountant at the time, just two or three years ago, and we're 
we're sitting there and I was witnessing, I was sharing with him, he's a spiritual person, but really his spirituality was new age, and I was talking to him, and he said, I know, Chris, I know what you're going to say. And I I said, what am I going to say? And he said, well, you're going to say that it doesn't really matter if the Bible's true or not, because as long as you believe it. And I said, no, actually, that isn't what I was going to say at all. I said, I would be foolish to put my trust in a book that I didn't believe was true. In terms of its historicity, I believe it's true. That's part of the gospel, the the truth of it. Whenever you doubt, as you may doubt from time to time, as we all do, you you come back to the the truth of this word, the the truth that when, when Mark is declaring John the Baptist came, preparing the way of the Lord, prophesied to by Isaiah 500 years before, this is true. This happened 2,000 years ago. This really happened. In Israel, the civilization that God built, preparing the way for his son, Jesus Christ, it's true. And that's very important. I don't know whether, you know, with the other religions, I, I know where Muhammad's concerned and his five pillars. What's important is the teaching. Do you believe the teaching? I can't help thinking that when Paul speaks in Galatians 4 and 5 and he's talking really about the law itself, about the commandments, about the trying to obey the law. And he said, it's really, he said, it's it's not the child of promise, it's the child of the flesh. It's the child that comes from Hagar. That's what he says about the law. You can't get more negative than that to a Jew. You really can't. Just wipes it out. But in ourselves, in our humanity, uh, we, we, we do, we, we want to think that somehow works work, but the gospel just doesn't work that way. The gospel isn't meant to work that way, and it is deeply, deeply unattractive to sinners when you talk about it that way. It's so attractive, the gospel. And we need to hear it again and again and again. I remember talking to someone at, at, at the evening service and, and watching people, you know, who became Christians at the time. And one girl, she said to me she, afterwards, she said, I have a question. Can I ask a question? And you know, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, and she said, well, it can't be true what you said. She said, it can't be true. I said, well, what did I say? Well, you, you told me, you told us that God isn't looking for moralistic, clean living, good people. I said, Absolutely. I said he saved a murderer, actually. Most of the New Testament is written by a murderer. She said, so you're telling me God isn't looking? No, he's not. You see, the gospel, John the Baptist, as he preached it, they understood it. The prostitutes understood it. It was very attractive to them. They came, they received, they were baptized in the Jordan. They they sat round with Jesus. Now that doesn't mean there's no in or out. It doesn't mean that that the, the, the standards of righteousness from God have changed. They haven't changed. It's just that he's able to eat and drink and talk without not even a hint of condemnation, not even a hint of judgment. I think most of us, in truth, find that hard to do with everyone. But Jesus didn't. That's the gospel. See, the gospel almost reveals itself to people when we're like that. Because people find that deeply, deeply um, attractive. So it's there in history. Uh, Paul says, whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, In 2 Corinthians 5, let me um, read this um, favorite quote of of mine. But, uh, you know, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin To be sin for us. That's the gospel. That's the simplicity of it. Although it, it, it doesn't declare the glory of it hardly and the, 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 the incredibleness of what God has done. But that's the gospel and where you and I live. You'll only know how much the gospel sometimes impinges you when your best friend or one of your children sin. How do you respond? Do you respond with legalistic Works, or do you respond with open armed, unconditional love? The way that Jesus would. And that's the transformation that God brings about, I think, with us 
and in his church. He hasn't had to lower the bar, he's just had to become sin for us to deal with us. And so that is rooted not in fiction, not in um, a story, but in history. This is truth. We can go back to factual, absolute human history. Christ has done this for, for you and me. That should make us uh, incredibly glad. Then secondly, as, or thirdly now, as, as, as you know, Mark 1 evolves really, but the, the thing that God has done, which I just read from Romans chapter 8, we're able to say Abba Father, and Ellie will be um, spoke on this um, last week or the week before, and it'll be on our uh, media channel soon. But it just infers on this identity. That's part of the gospel. You see, you can be saved, if you like. You can you can have and conferred on you the righteousness of God in Christ. Your sins are forgiven, but you might not really look like a great Christian because you've just come in. I don't know what Mary Magdalene looked like afterwards, and we call that sanctification or discipleship in the church, that we're to go on with God so that we begin to look like him now. The fact that we're in is all him. The fact that we begin to look like him is him and us. We have to do something. We have to walk with him, and God begins to redecorate and remodel who we are. He begins to knock down some walls. He begins to challenge us. He begins to affirm us. He may begin to discipline us. But with all of those things, bear in mind, God loves us and we are becoming and meant to become and look more like him. And I believe many times without understanding that or understanding the words of Jesus, we, we, we don't understand. We take salvation. We said, that's the gospel. I'm saved. But we don't take the, either the words of Paul or the words of Jesus. We don't understand the construct of God. He wants to change us. He wants us to look like him. And God is very serious about that process in you and me. And for you and me, that's different things. For the rich young man who was addicted to money, it was like, give up your money and follow Jesus. In our comfortable, western, easy life, I know it's, Life is never easy, so I shouldn't say that really. Uh, Life isn't easy, but it's a lot easier than living in Bangladesh or India. It's a lot easier than the poverty that many people find themselves in. Well, however, you know, difficult our lives are, um, God wants us to look like Him. And so what does looking like Him look like? What does Jesus look like? What does he want you and me to look like in history? So he confers on us a status, an identity, the righteousness of God in Christ. Our sins are taken away. We now belong to him. We're now a son or daughter. We now have the spirit living inside of us. That's all the gospel. But lastly, we have to begin to look like him. And to look like him... We have to become and are weak. I think even sometimes when people say, I've invited Christ into my life, like they had something to do with it. Or that somehow we can manipulate God a little bit, that, you know, maybe God will make us prosperous, or I've come to Jesus because he'll do thus and so. None of that. We come to Christ as beggars, really. We come to Christ with nothing. We're bankrupt. Utterly nothing. And Jesus redeems us and he transfers on us his righteousness that we begin to look like him. That's the good news. But then we should begin to look like him. And what does Jesus look like? He looks like the opposite of our culture. Our culture converts, what, status, power, wealth, authority. They're the things our society likes to see. What school did you go to? Who are your parents? How much money have you got? Increasingly in our culture, those that don't have money are going to find it more and more difficult. Not just because they haven't got enough money, but because they'll be ignored. Maybe they won't have the, you know, we, maybe they won't have the same access to medicine or the same access to a judicial system that's fair or the same access to education because they haven't got enough money. But Jesus, look at him. He was poor and weak. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus began his ministry, he said, he's anointed me to preach, what, good news to the poor? To the poor? 
Those that recognize their need. Always the poor recognize their need. Let me tell you, and I've been to a third world country, they really do. Jesus was homeless. Jesus was tortured. Jesus was weak. I know none of us will vote to be poor, homeless, or tortured. I know we don't vote for that. But with, I don't know, I think it's 11 or 12 million Syrians now who are effectively homeless, have been displaced. Many of those millions are Christians. Many of those millions in the world now living in Iraq, um, many of those Christians now have lost everything as far as the world is concerned. They've lost everything. But let me tell you, in certain ways, they look more like Jesus. But we don't always want the gospel to impinge on us that much, but that is the gospel. That is what the gospel looks like. When Jesus walked around, he didn't, he didn't look like a man of great status. He didn't look like a man of great power. You know, Paul, Paul says about himself, when I'm weak, I'm strong. And to, to come up, you've got to go down. You've got to kind of reduce yourself. And whenever I see people, Christian people being reduced, and some people say, oh, that's the enemy doing it to them. And they say, no, it's, it's the Lord. He's just, he's just reducing you until you understand you have nothing, only him. Until our dependency isn't on things. It isn't even on a salary. It isn't even on a spouse. It's on him. Everything's on him. Our life depends on him. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that, that was preached. That's why Jesus sent his disciples out and said, you're not allowed to take money. You're not allowed to take a bag. You're not allowed to take an extra cloak. Depend on me. I'm enough. That's the gospel. And when we depend that way, when we see that way, our, our identity, our transformation, we begin not only to look like him, but we also understand, like Jesus, he's paid for my sin. It doesn't matter my works. I'm doing it for him. Spurgeon had a lovely example of this one time. He talks about a kingdom and a king and a, a poor gardener that would tend some of his gardens. And this poor gardener respected, admired, and uh, really liked the king. The king was benevolent. He was a kind king. And he grew his vegetables. And one particular vegetable, he grew this carrot. It was huge. And he decided he would give the king this carrot. So he took it to him and he said, King, I want to give you this carrot that's, that's grown. And he wanted to give it to him out of love. And the king took it. And the king was touched. And the king said to him, I'm going to give you the gardens at the side of my palaces and you can tend, you can tend those gardens. But I'm giving them to you and to those that come after you generationally. But a rich nobleman heard that. And he saw what the king had done for him. And the king thought, well, if he'll do that, the, the nobleman thought, if the king will do that for a carrot, I wonder what he'd give for a horse. So the king, so this nobleman, he went and spent his money and bought a horse. And he presented the horse to the king to see what he would get. Now I'm saying that to say this, that isn't how Christianity works. We have a benevolent and wonderful king, but he's not interested in what we're growing for him. He's not interested in what we can give him. He just wants us. He saved us whilst we were yet sinners. And we're to be like him and set an example like him and Christianity should just grow. I know we try and grow it with programs and we promulgate this and that, but believe me, we've never had better programs. We've never had bigger and better churches with more TV screens, better technology and Christianity still isn't attractive to our young people who are leaving. It's still not attractive to the world at large because we've got to look like him. And to look like him sometimes is to be put in a place that you and I don't want to be put in. It's to look weak. But that's how the gospel, that's how the news is heralded. So when Jesus came, he didn't look like very much John the Baptist. I mean, he was weird, wasn't he? He lived out in the desert wearing, you know, weird camel hair things. He ate locusts. I mean, what a weirdo. 
And yet here he is coming in. He's, you know, we look at these saints from the Bible. We look at these people and, and we, we just look at them through rosy colored spectacles. The same way with Paul. I don't think most of the churches in the UK would like the Apostle Paul. He's not a great orator. He's been beaten within an inch of his life. He must have looked. I, I can't imagine what the Apostle Paul must have looked like. But he says, I bear on my body. He says, I don't want any more trouble with you, Corinthians. He said, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. No one else could say that. Oh, they could speak with their oratory. They could speak with their um, status. They could speak with their philosoph- philosophical um, rendition. And they looked like they were something in the world. And Paul didn't. But Paul represents what Christianity is meant to look like. That's why whenever we move Christianity too close to governmental structures and to power structures, we reduce its power, really. And it's the reason why Christianity is growing in Muslim-majority countries right now, which I dare not even mention, unless we, we, we just can't mention, but Christianity is growing across the world, and it's growing in places that are amazing, truly amazing. Muslim-majority countries, they haven't got the churches, they haven't got the TV screens, the technology, the programs, they've got nothing. And yet it's growing, not, not just with a few. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people are coming to Christ. China was the same. Mao Zedong did everything to kill off the church. All the missionaries had to leave. Even conservatively now, 100 million Chinese Christians. And again, they haven't had all the advantages that we have. So what does it tell us? What does the, the gospel close with this? Well, we need to see the gospel broadly, We need to understand its simplicity and we need to hold fast to the fact that Jesus has died for our sins. But we also need to understand Jesus is very serious about this gospel impinging on our day-to-day life. It's meant to alter the way we live. It's meant to alter the way we treat people, the way we look like. That's why the words of Jesus are so very, very important. And if we just take salvation by faith and say that's at the center when it's not, It's the whole package we need. And then, I believe, we're going to find a gospel that brings freedom to us. A gospel that we enjoy. A gospel that we eat and drink and love. A gospel that's attractive to those around us. A gospel that's full of the presence and of the Spirit of God. And a gospel that ultimately destines us to an eternity in heaven with our glorious Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit.